Thank you. So uh, Senate Government Operations, it is uh, Wednesday, April 21st. I have to look at my computer to see what the date is. And um, <clears throat> we're going to be <coughs> looking today again at the retirement um, pension um, bill that came to us from the House. It is um, H449. <coughs> Yesterday, we spent some time on the governance issue, and today we're going to be looking at the, um, the task force that is set up to um, review the benefit um, package as we go forward. So um, I think what I'd like to do is, um, I see Mike is with us now, and um, I think I'll start because this this most um, I think I'm right here <clears throat> has um, a huge impact on the um, plan participants. So I think what what the way I'd like to start is to hear from uh, Mike O'Neill. Jeff Fannin and um, Steve Howard first around some of the issues that they have around it and then have the conversation there. Does that make sense committee? Because yep. I know they have um, some real concerns about it. So that's, I think I'd <laughs> like to start there. And Mike, I guess, since you're the only one here right now, I guess we better start <coughs> with you. Thank you. It looks like I lucked out. Uh, <laughs> or not. Committee. Yeah. <laughs> Mike O'Neill, um, the director of the Vermont Troopers Association. Um, thanks for the chance to testify again on this issue. Um, to start with, we appreciate the decision made by the House and Senate leadership to go in the direction of creating a task force to study this issue. As you know, there was a lot of concern from our membership a lot of real fear over what was coming with some of the proposals that were put out there. And, you know, one of our hopes was that we would have the chance to study the impact of this and fully understand exactly what was being proposed and what it would do to the workforce. Um, so to start with, with the makeup of the task force, um, there wasn't an amendment made that gave the VTA a seat there. Originally, we didn't have a seat, so we do now. Um, we are comfortable with that. And the concern we have is with the um, charge of the committee, you know, what, what the committee is supposed to be looking at and accomplishing. And, you know, the way this is worded, the committee is going to look at reducing the ADEC, the annual required contribution, and the unfunded liability back to the level required in FY21, or what the, F, what the unfunded liability was then and what the ADEC was then. It certainly seems to me that this language is predetermining the outcome of the task force's work. You know, it may not be telling the task force what the benefit changes will be or what benefits will be diminished, but if the task force is being told what the savings need to be, we're definitely predetermining what is going to be, what we're gonna have for an outcome. And how does the workforce have any faith in a report that's issued by a task force that's told what to um, have for an end result? You know, we really feel what should be looked at very closely is what the appropriate benefit structure should be and determine how that is paid for. You know, should some of those savings come from the employees? The answer is probably yes, but what is the right level to be coming from the employees? And what is the right level for the employer to have to absorb some of this cost going forward? You know, this is a problem that neither side is directly responsible for. You know, the, the change that we saw in the unfunded liability in the ADEC was due to changes in assumptions from the actuaries and it had a big impact. We all understand what that did to the numbers we're looking at, but why should that all be put on the backs of the employees in diminished benefits? 
And these are benefits that they have been paying for in contributions since their first pay period with the state. When you're hired, you're not asked whether or not you want to pay into the retirement system. You're obligated to pay into the retirement system. And I know your committee earlier in the session had some discussions about whether or not there is a contract between the employees and the employer. There's no discussion of that in any of the duties of this task force. Yeah, you know, I believe that's something that should be another piece of what the task force does is look very closely at what that contractual relationship is. And with that relationship in mind, what can be changed with employees that are already paying their uh, contributions and what can't be? Yeah, you know, that's something that needs to be fully understood before any changes should be proposed to benefits. It's a big piece of what we're dealing with here. Um, the other concern I see with this is just the time frame, and I testified to the same thing in the House. The, the work of the committee will start on June fifteenth, and a report be issued by September first. And I think probably everybody here has been involved in some type of summer study, and seen how difficult it is to uh, schedule some of these when you're working with this commission. Will have our task force will have fifteen people on it, and it's not easy to schedule those meetings over the summer and get it done in a period that's that short. So if, if the work of the task force is really going to be meaningful, they need to have the appropriate amount of time to get the work completed and issue a report that isn't rushed or cut short in some way just because we're trying to meet a time frame that has been put into this language. So I, I think that covers the concerns I have. I don't know if anybody has any questions. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions right now for Mike? And then just, <clears throat> I think what we'll do is hear from everybody and then try to have kind of a general conversation about it because <clears throat> I think that um, that will um, lead us to better thinking and better results if we, if we can just have a kind of a general conversation as we go forward. But Senator Rahm? Well, <clears throat> um, I just wanted to ask my, my understanding is that there's language in there that alludes to looking at um, defined contributions as opposed to defined benefits. And I just like everyone who speaks to have an opportunity to say how that, you know, is landing with their members as well. That isn't something our members would have any interest in is going away from a defined benefit system. Um, you know, the defined contribution systems are, as we all know, are widely used in the private sector. It's a big part of why people come to work in the public sector. You know, th these benefits are important to our members, but they're just as important to the state of Vermont as an employer. And if they're not there to attract people and retain people, it's a problem we're all going to see down the road. It's especially important to a department like the state police. You know, our rank structure is built on longevity. <coughs> to move up through the chain of command, we need people to stay in employment for an entire career. If we were to go to a defined contribution, it doesn't keep people there. they are retirements that are portable. People could leave at any time and it would do damage that I don't think the state police could recover from. I'm not sure how we would maintain a rank structure if we didn't have a benefit structure that kept people in employment for an entire career. Senator Colmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Mike, I think I raised this, the last point you made about the uh, timeline. When we had the members of the House Committee in, um, I also felt that June 15th and then the end of the September was a pretty compressed time. I think they're um, called to meet maybe nine times, if I'm remembering correctly, something like that. And the answer that was given, at least at the time, and I, I understand this part, too, is that every day that goes by that we don't have a solution that um, you know, we continue to sort of lose more money, if you will. But I'm wondering whether if you gave another month, and I don't know the answer to this, maybe um, Beth or Tom know better. I mean, how much are we really talking about <coughs> adding to the debt in a month or, or an additional six weeks? I'm just, or do you have a sort of an end date that fits better into your view of this? Okay, if I can just respond to that for one sure. second. My, uh, these, whatever is come up with by the task force has got to be adopted by the legislature anyway. So nothing is gonna happen until January. 
So what <laughs> doesn't make any difference if they come up with a benefit structure on June 20th or December 20th, the legislature has to act on it. My understanding from the house was that they wanted it done because they have to start dealing with um, redistricting and they're going to be busy with that. But I, <clears throat> and, and I have sympathy for that, but I also feel that this is a really important issue and they have 11 members on their committee and maybe they have to divide up the work somehow so that they can start redistricting. I, I don't think we should um, set an artificial date here to um, accommodate that. That that was my understanding of why they set that date. And I stand corrected, Madam Chair. You are correct. I think um, <coughs> the representative, the, the chair of the House Committee, did mention that. Right. Yeah. I think we would also know from the treasurer's office and the retirement division, can they accomplish some of the work that will need to be done in that short a time period? Because a lot of it will rely on um, work being given out to an actuary and getting the information back. And it may be very difficult just dealing with that piece. And I think they're scheduled to meet, um, <clears throat> they're allowed to meet 15 times, but it's only 11 weeks. So. It is pretty compressed. Well noted. Any other questions for Mike right now? <clears throat> um, Steve, you weren't here when we first started. And um, the way I decided to do today was to start with the, with the VTA, the VSEA, and the NEA, because you have, <clears throat> I believe, the main concerns about this section of the bill and then and then hear from um, others who may may have some suggestions but um, have not expressed as many concerns. So uh, Mike got to start because he was here and now I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll try to, to, uh, to, it's a hard act to follow. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> okay, well, you're done then. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so on this portion of the bill, I think, you know, you've heard me say um, that fairness and equity and, e and equality are sort of the key balance or the key buzzwords <clears throat> that I would use to describe this, um, our concerns about the current House proposal. I would add a word, and that is credibility, um, which is really important uh, for our members. Um, we really don't have that much concern about who um, is on the task force outside of um, our uh, outside of the uh, members of the three labor unions. Our concern is that the number of members in the three labor unions be equal to the people to the number of members who are not in those three labor unions. So whomever. Um, the non-labor um, members are, meaning whoever is not in one of those three labor unions, you know, we don't really have any concern about. Uh, we're used to sitting at the bargaining table across from uh, folks who have different philosophies and different views of the world, and we work out an agreement. Um, we're used to working collaboratively with <laughs> the administration of whatever party happens to be in power. Um, to govern our health care plan, and we have one of the best managed health care plans in the country. Um, what we're not um, comfortable with is not having equal voice at the table. So that, I think, is important. I also would say, um, and, I, and the timeline is really part of this, you know, the speed at which the leadership in the House tried to move the Speaker's proposal really caused a, a, a vicious backlash from our members who thought that they um, that the that the political leadership was trying to shove something you know sort of through the process without vetting it without without allowing them to be heard um, so we don't want to repeat the same mistakes um, that were made in that process and I and I think the the truncated process of, Ju of June to September <clears throat> is really hard um, we are still managing a pandemic. We hope that you know around July, the governor has said that he thinks we'll probably be turning the corner on that. 
And you know, our members are the folks who led the state through the pandemic, um, and they're still doing that. Um, so a little bit more time um, would be very valuable. And I, and I think what you said, Madam Chair, is, is, a, is accurate. I mean, we do understand the speaker's concern and the, the, the House Government Operations concern about redistricting. But really, to tell you the truth, when it comes to comparing the financial impact of, on our members of the of changes to retirement, um, you know, that is not really something that we consider a part of our problem. Um, and, and we think it's manageable that they should be able to do both at the same time. And we told them so when we testified on, on the House side. Um, one, in, one aspect of this, and I know the teachers share this concern that's very important, uh, especially for the Government Operations Committee, and I'll repeat it because I did say it last Friday, but this whatever comes out of this committee, um, however it's done, and the, I think one of the things that needs to be deeply investigated is the impact on staffing in state government, um, particularly in the in the places where with a with a with the current pension that is seven percent less, the benefit is seven percent less than the national average, and when you can just go to New Hampshire and either work for the federal government's Department of Corrections or the New Hampshire Department of Corrections or the New York Department of Corrections and have more pay and better retirement. Um, we, we really could have uh, serious impacts uh, on all, um, on all uh, classifications, but particularly in the classifications where we already have high vacancies. And I don't have to tell the chair who represents a border <coughs> county or, or a Senator Collimore or Senator Clarkson, uh, anybody who lives you know, within a border that if you, can get, if you can work in another state and get better benefits, you know, the commute is not that bad. Um, for, for a lot of folks. Um, so that's a concern that I think really has to be um, looked at. The other thing that there's some, some very prescriptive language in there about almost, you know, about what the goals of the task force have to be. And we really believe that the task force has the resources within its own um, makeup to decide what the goals should be. And, you know, maybe the legislature doesn't know what the right goals should are in the time that they've looked at it. So I, I would recommend that that language be removed and that, um, and that the task force decide, you know, how much of the unfunded liability they think really needs to be eliminated, how much of the ADEC needs to be eliminated. That's really something that the task force should decide and they shouldn't be told what to do. Um, I mean, this bill goes as far as to tell you who the witnesses should be. Um, so it, it's really, a, um, it's the, the, I think everybody sort of knows this, but one of the big lessons, um, that in th one of the things that we continuously try to share with your colleagues from the other body is that the process really matters. It really, really matters. And if people don't feel, as our president, Amy Town says, in every opportunity she has, if they don't feel heard and valued, um, then they, uh, they give up and they become cynical. Um, and we don't want that in this case. Um, I, I, know that, I, I know that's something that, that is, has, um, is, a, is a major concern for the members of the, the, the SEA. And Senator Rahm's question also is a very important point. Um, we agree with Treasurer Pierce uh, that a defined benefit plan is a more secure, less costly plan uh, for the state of Vermont. And that it, you know, 62 cents on every dollar uh, comes from the good decisions that Tom Galunka makes. Um, and we, we are pulling money out of Wall Street and we are spending it on Main Street in Rutland, in Fairhaven. In Woodstock, 78% um, of our members retire and stay in Rutland and stay in the state. And they are, they are investing in local businesses. This is the most important economic development program in the state. Um, and so to even have this in the bill as even a possibility um, is, I think, a bad omen um, uh, for... Um, uh, for the future of the retirement system. And if you look nationally, 
the state, and I know Treasurer Pierce has made some efforts to try to fix this problem uh, that we supported, which is that Vermont has very little, Vermonters in general have very little retirement savings. Um, and so what happens when more people go on less stable retirement programs like defined contribution plans is that they run out of money and they become dependent on the social safety net. Um, so do we wanna have money pulled in off of Wall Street and spent in the private sector on Main Street? Or do we wanna have a less stable, more costly retirement system that encourages uh, the use of, this, of the social safety net um, to, um, to, for people to survive? And you know, you know, the social safety net is not funded by Wall Street. It's funded by taxes that Vermonters pay. Uh, so if you're for the affordability agenda, you are for a defined benefit plan. So <clears throat> I'm gonna ask committee members if they have any questions right now, but I would first, so I would like us to think about a couple of things here. If, if there is an, unbal an imbalance, <clears throat> how do we correct that balance? Are there suggestions to, as to how to correct the, the imbalance? And, <clears throat> and I, I understand when I first was, um, thinking about the imbalance, it seemed to me that the three, the six legislators that were on here are not either labor or non-labor. But when, when you and Jeff both were talking about the balance, you were talking about plan participants and non-plan participants, and that <clears throat> that's the balance you're seeking. So how would you, how would you correct that balance? And then I just have a very specific question for if somebody can just help me understand this in the charge of the, the um, task force. It says, including a review of whether or all, all or part of retirement income should be tax exempt. Is that really part of the, isn't that for the finance committees to, to determine what, should, right. what kinds of retirement should be? And are, are we talking about here all, all? Yeah retirees in the state and why is why is this even in here can somebody Correct. answer that huh? Madam, are you asking me that madam chair i'm asking anybody who has oh, an okay. answer for it allison okay. I, I i absolutely think that does not belong in here and it is in the purview of uh house ways and means and senate finance that is not appropriate here that's what i i i just uh, that just leapt out at me and i so I just wondered if anybody else had me, that me concern. Too. And, and may I? Uh, yes, you please. Talk, yeah, I'd like to know what the <laughs> recommendations are in balance because it seems to me that six legislators are pretty heavy. So I, I, you know, one way to look at balancing this would do four legislators seems just fine, and then three professionals who actually know what they're talking about, uh, in and six participants. And you know, so I think that the expertise of the three identified non-participants uh, who may be participating actually in this, they may be participants in the pension system. No, they um, can't be according to the, the bill that we have in front of us. But do, do, don't all state employees pay, in, <coughs> no matter whether you're a VSEA or not, pay into the state? Oh, oh the legislators. No, the, I'm not talking about legislators. I'm talking about the, the uh, HR. Oh, I see, HR. I see, I see. Aren't they all? Aren't they? Don't they all pay into the pension? There's a there's a small uh, senator. There's a small group of people, and it's a shrinking group of people um, who are very wise. Uh, it's because most state employees are in the defined benefit plan, and that's those are the those are the folks who really looked at it. Defined there is a defined contribution plan that is available to some exempt employees. But the numbers of participants in that plan are declining. Right, um, I've, I, I've heard that. So just to go back to balance it, I would uh, propose that we, in you know, unless we hear from Steve, Jeff, or Mike, uh, you know, that I think it's a pretty legislature heavy, and I'd rather see experts like HR, DFR, and the retirement uh, whiz at, tre at at the treasurer's office serve more than six <laughs> legislators. So. My so <clears throat> I am going to ask, I'm going to ask again, again, put um, Commissioner Pichak on the spot and ask um, 
<laughs> why why you're on this one in particular as a member as opposed to a uh, there are it seems to me that whoever is on this task force you can't get all of the expertise that you need on this on this task force and there's going to have to be outside expertise um, that that the task force um, relies on to come and give testimony. So I'm just curious as to whether you think you should be on here or a, um, somebody who is consulted and gives advice. Yeah, well, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Nice to see everybody uh, again today. So, you know, I, I think probably similar to the testimony that we provided yesterday, I can talk a little bit about our department's um, background and expertise, but really leave it to the committee to determine, you know, if DFR makes sense um, in terms of a member of the task force. But, you know, a couple of areas I can think of that, um, you know, we certainly, you know, whether it's my personal experience or the experience of our department that we can draw on. Um, DFR has a seat on on BSTERS, which is the, as you all know, is the um, teacher's um, retirement of board. And we also regulate VHI, which provides health insurance to that retiree group. So we do have that experience and knowledge when it comes to the issues facing um, retirees in the, in the teacher system and their healthcare costs. Uh, generally, obviously we're familiar with healthcare costs also as we regulate the commercial um, healthcare uh, industry. Um, separately, you know, we often have, we often work very closely with actuaries inside or outside of our department about things like, um, you know, expected uh, returns, expected uh, longevity of individuals that are being insured, you know, what the amount of um, money that needs to be put aside, what's the solvency of the company. So, I mean, those kind of technical skills and um, financial acumen is, is something that, you know, comes second, second nature to us. So uh, I think that's another skill set that we bring. But again, um, you know, we didn't, we weren't, we weren't, um, you know, we weren't raising our hand to be on the task force, nor, um, you know, uh, did we provide any testimony actually in the House side. So leave it, leave it to um, the legislature. We're happy to serve if that's the decision. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Commissioner at this point? <clears throat> okay, I think that, Jeff, you were not here when we uh, first started. And um, what we thought is we would go first to the um, people who have um, raised the most concerns with us. And so we've heard from Mike O'Neill and Steve Howard and would like to hear from you. And I do know that, notice that you've posted, uh, we have some documents that you've posted um, and <clears throat> we've talked about um, suggestions for how to solve the imbalance and then um, the timeline. Those are the things that so far have been brought up as, as um, the major concerns, I believe, in my, by your other two colleagues. Well, uh, if, if I may. Um, yes, please, please. Right. So for the record, Jeff Fannin, Vermont and EA. Um, thank you for uh, letting me speak to you today. I'm apologize for being a bit hard. Can I just stop you for a second? Sorry, Mike, maybe if you mute, it would help, but there's like a lot of feedback. Yeah, sorry, I'm in Winooski and it's probably plans. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, um, it's always fun on Zoom. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> no, I'm being sarcastic. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. I, you know, in, in all essence, in, we support the, the bill as it's going through. We have a couple suggested tweaks. Uh, we appreciate the good work the House has done and doing. And they made some changes yesterday, as I understand it. I haven't fully digested those. One of them was changing the, um, uh, the report out from the task force. I think they made it till September 15, but in my written testimony, I'm suggesting October, uh, just to give a bit more time for the task force to accomplish its work. It's a serious undertaking and significant. And, and I just want to, you know, give them the time they need to come up with, you know, their report. I, so certainly the house understood there was a problem with timing, extended it, but just two weeks. And I think it, it could go a bit further. And I don't know what uh, Mike or um, Steve said. Senator Rahm, did you have a I do, and maybe it's related to a misunderstanding that I've had. I, I thought that there was a limitation on beneficiaries sitting on the final governance committee, but not on the task force. And it relates to a question I would have about 
teachers and was there any was there thinking that if, it, if there's a teacher on the committee they'd have a really hard time you know ending in October when they've just been a month doing back to school work as well but maybe I'm just still mistaken about I, I might have misspoken okay. on that when I said that the what it says here is that the legislative Appoint, appointees to the committee cannot be members of the retirement plan and the, and members of the retirement plan that are appointed by the unions cannot be legislators that's the i i think that i think i misled you there a little bit but uh, senator clarkson madam chair i think uh uh Keisha may also be referring to, to sort of some of the time frames that were discussed in relation to when people were working. But I, I think I point out that everybody on this task force is working. Yeah. And, you know, everybody, you know, and, and we've just had the NEA propose it go to October 1st. So uh, we, but, but I think originally we heard that the task force would start mid June because of the teacher schedule, but in all honesty, everybody's going to be working and the, and the meetings are going to be, have to be scheduled thoughtfully to, to, to deal with that. So I, I think everybody's working in some capacity or another. So it's, it's always a scheduling challenge. Yes, okay. absolutely true. So I just, just to, to clear, I'm in my written testimony, I talk about October 15, just to be clear, uh, understanding that yesterday, um, the house appropriations committee said, I think said September 15, I extended, I thought another month was sufficient. So uh, I say October, but what I meant, uh, Senator Clarkson, was October 15, just to be clear. That's what I'm suggesting. And if I could just say that, that's kind of where I was going, is the fir first of October, that's, that's that last month is going to be really intense decisions while teachers are also getting kids back to school. So October 15th feels more reasonable to me. That, okay. But, but every everybody's working. And at least, I, yeah. Yes, I mean, everybody is going to be working. The state employees are going to be very busy. The legislators are going to be very busy because they all have other jobs. Everybody's going to be busy. So my guess, my question is, why would we not make this report due December 15th like we do all reports? So anyway, that's- I, I, would, not, uh, I would not stand in the way of that, Senator White. Um, but I know that, <laughs> that people wanted this earlier rather than later, so- being respectful and trying to meet a balance here. Uh, we're suggesting October 15th, but if, if yeah. you want to push it out to November or December one or something like that, that, that would not be objectionable to, to us. Uh, I would just remind our chair that our drafting deadlines the first week of December. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I don't know if Senator Polina had your hand up and I don't want to be yeah. late chair, but uh, I was just going to agree with the need to desire to push it out further <laughs> into December. The other option would be, if we would write this into the plan, but to put an interim report out sometime in the fall to give people a chance to comment on it and then come back with the final report this in early December. Oh. The way they did the higher education report, whether they like it or not, they basically did a preliminary report that they released so people could respond to it. And then they did a final report later on. It was interesting, yeah. So Jeff? That's, that's an intriguing idea, Senator Polina. Um, uh -huh. it, uh, it, it certainly may have merit and give people time to sort of see where the, get a weather report, see what's going on, and, the, and then a final written report thereafter. Um, right. Yeah. It's intriguing. Because yeah. it would make, it'd be easier then to prepare for the upcoming legislative session because we would have some discussion over the fall, but not have the actual final document until early December. Anyway, it's just a thought for now. Yep. It, it, oh, yeah. It's a good thought, perhaps. Um, let's let Jeff finish his. Yeah, I, I, I'd say let's be open and, and, and weigh our House colleagues' challenge with uh, reapportionment, too. So, I mean, I, I think we have to be thoughtful about everybody's pressures. Absolutely. Um, so, I'll start. Uh, I go back. I started at the end of my written testimony with the timeline because. Seems like you folks were talking about it and I wanted to get there and obviously it's a bit of a conversation. So composition for us still is uh, a need of balance uh, to convey any work and recommendations that come out as, as one of being from fairness. So we think that it's important to, that plan and 
participants, as I talked about yesterday, i.e. employees, and non-planned participants, uh, they need to be balanced out. And whether you add to the union, uh, Vermont NEA, VSEA, or uh, VTA there, or delete on somewhere else, it, it does not matter to us. We just think that driving at fairness and balance is what we're, we're looking for. Um, as to the charge, one, one, right out of the gate, one of the charges that I think needs to be adjusted is found um, at 10, section 10 C1A, which is on page 22 uh, of 27 in my, my, my world. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it's talking about establishing the targets back to the pre-June rate of last year. Um, and for, you know, initially the, uh, the treasurer's proposal, uh, the house initial proposal a few months ago, neither one achieved that target. So it seems like we're sending the task force on a fool's errand. And I don't think that's advisable. Uh, it wasn't obtainable by the others. Um, I think we ought to let the task force hear from informed entities, people, and then establish the targets that they think are reasonable and practical and achievable for the plan, keeping in mind the targets themselves and how they impact on the workforce, on employers and, and the system as a whole. So I think that's uh, really, you know, that target right out of the box is, is a problem. Uh, and to meet the target seems to undercut the work of the task force, right? You've given them marching orders. It's, uh, it preordains a, a finish that they've been asked to examine truly. So if you're gonna ask them to do the hard work, and I think you are, uh, we ought to let them do that hard work and not preordain uh, an outcome. I think that's, you know, that's right out of the box. The charge needs to be adjusted to let them find the target that works for the system at large. Um, we still have concerns about the workforce recruitment and retention. And I think everybody's heard about, um, Certainly, I'll, I'll speak to the teachers and I won't speak to the troopers and, and, and the state employees for Steve, but I know they've heard the same thing, that uh, finding people and retaining people to be employed is a challenge right now. And uh, we ought to let, um, in fact, the, the Secretary of Education, Dan French, just two weeks ago spoke to the, the shortage of teachers, qualified teachers in, in Vermont right now. So the task force should examine the effects of any changes benefit structures, contribution characteristics, and uh, on the workforce recruitment and retention. Um, and we think that's important to, to include in their work. Uh, the impact on other state benefits, um, and I think I've said this here, I certainly said it in House GovOps, um, in the early 2000s, the state had to step in, and I think I remember being in Senate GovOps many years ago, and the state had to step in and actually increase teachers' pensions unilaterally because they were so low and that people were significantly below the poverty line. And so the state stepped in and, and increased teacher pensions. And uh, I'm not suggesting we do that, but we ought to look at uh, how these changes might affect people of color, women in particular, who are, make up 77% of the teaching ranks um, and public uh, state employees as well to uh, make sure that we don't drop anybody below lines, poverty lines or otherwise, that we, we really don't want them to be dropping below, adding to the cost of state government and other places. Um, and the impact of underfunding, certainly in the teacher system, and I'll speak to that only, um, the underfunding is, is, is clearly a challenge for the teacher system. If you look at the, um, the difference in funding, full funding for the state employees, for example, versus the teacher, it's about uh, is it 16, 17% difference, if you're point difference. Um, and that's because of underfunding and I think underfunding only because we've been investing with them, as we know with VPIC for more than a decade. So that seems to be an underfunding issue that ought to be accounted for as well and looked at. Um, we still believe and think that there needs to be a dedicated revenue and proper use of the one-time funds. So we think that, um, uh, S-59, which is the um, bill that would actually increase taxes on the wealthiest among us, ought to be incorporated, at least mentioned in the, in the bill here, to have the task force look at that, whether there should be a dedicated revenue source. As well, and separate and apart, we think included in the bill ought to be use of the $150 million one-time funds right now. 
Using that money now seems to be a wise fiscal decision. I don't think anybody really objects to that and thinks that it isn't wise to do. So why are we all you know, reserving the money? Let's use it now so that we, uh, we can begin to address some of the underfunding and, and the ratio problems that are, we're trying to address. Use it now, use it early, sort of the reverse, comp it's the compounding effect. Let's use it. We have it now. The economic arm has been given a, a, a good shoot, a boost from the federal dollars and we've increased our revenues. Let's use those wisely now to put towards the pension. Um, and finally, um, the intersection with healthcare costs and teacher system. The governor often talks about the OPEB four buckets uh, and we're requesting some language added to the bill to talk about healthcare costs that should be enhanced uh, to study healthcare benefit design innovations in the, in the state education system not in the state employees, but in the education system. It's a little bit different in the education world. We've got, you know, we're now finally bargaining at the state level for that, but look at that more holistically and uh, take a look at what we could change there in the healthcare arena, because it does, the OPEBs, the other post-employment benefits do affect uh, the state's contribution. So we think that ought to be added into the mix as it relates to educators. Um, so I've got draft language that I've, I've sent along it includes all of those and, and some specific wording. And uh, we hope that you will consider those and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Does anybody have any questions for Jeff right now? And I did, I apologize because I didn't read your um, before this and I- No need to apologize. I just sent it, to, you know, a half hour ago, whatever it was. Oh. There's no apology necessary. <clears throat> okay. So committee where, um, okay, let's, um, I'd like to hear from um, Mr. Galanka and Treasurer Pierce about whether, about their, where they are with the, with the, the task force. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. <clears throat> VPIC did not take a position on this section. We were, we were more concerned about governance, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I will say a couple of things. I think, you know, we've had informal meetings, Beth and I, with members of the legislature. We had a study group with the governor's staff a year and a half ago, right before COVID, which we got together with. And they, they were positive, but they never really went anywhere. I think formalizing it through some type of task force like this is, is positive. And I think uh, it, 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 it will move it forward, I think, better than we were able to do you know, a number of years ago. Um, I, in terms of the specifics of the task force, I won't, I won't, you know, in terms of makeup, you know, I think I'll leave that to you. <laughs> that, that seems to be a, a beehive I don't want to go into. Um, the rest of the topics in regards to to be overly, some, some seem to be overly prescriptive in regards to it has to meet certain benchmarks. Um, I'd also put in the document something to say and any other uh, ideas that the task force can come up to that haven't been thought of at the legislative level, because there may be other good ideas. I know Oregon did a study years ago where they uh, tasked a, uh, a task force similar to this, and they did more broad goals where it was like re reduce the unfunded liability by give us ideas that we could then prioritize in terms of cost and, and benefit, and the legislature would pri prioritize that going forward. So generally, I think it's a good idea to have a task force. Um, in terms of structure, I'll leave that up to you. But uh, anytime you address this unfunded liability issue, it will help the pension board meet our obligations, which in particular for the teachers, um, you know, we're running a 40 million deficit every, every quarter. So we need to come up with $40 million every quarter, basically $15 million a month. Um, and that's not going away anytime soon unless you address some of these issues. Um, benefit changes have an immediate uh, uh, impact on actuarial changes. Investment returns take five years to smooth into the, to the puzzle. So uh, these type of decisions will have more of an immediate impact. So I'll turn it over to Beth if you have any. I, I am just going to say the, one of your things about, the, about um, whether or not we define we have uh, are so prescriptive around the the um, savings, uh, and, but it does say including the following. And our drafting, um, the way drafting is in the legislature is 
if it says including the following and it, it means not to exclude other things. So they've start, stopped dropping that from there because including always means anything else that you can think of. Just thought I'd throw that out there just to, to make sure that we all understood that, that that is there. Thanks, Beth. You are muted still. I'm better with numbers than technology. I just like to point that out. So um, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak. And I've been taking notes because I've heard some very thoughtful uh, input and I've tried to incorporate some of that in, uh, in my recommendations. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, um, uh, to listen to those um, uh, discussions. And uh, as I said, incorporate it. You know, when we started our process, uh, we had, uh, for the most part, four meetings a week. Two meetings with the um, uh, with uh, the VSEA and the um, and uh, the Troopers Association, and two meetings with uh, the NEA. Uh, I also did a town meeting uh, with. The, the numbers I hear Jeff, uh, Jeff go from 800 to 1,000, but it's, it's a large number. Um, and uh, again, in the state system, about 350 employees. Uh, uh, we had 100 plus people on, the, uh, on their council. Uh, I met with another very large group, the Chittenden Democrats, uh, excuse me, <laughs> I'm sorry, the Chittenden uh, VSEA, and uh, um, as well as uh, the, the troopers. So, you know, I think that that's very important. And I think that that will be one of the, the, the comments I have about balance and about uh, timeframes. So let me begin uh, with the creation. Um, and I'm going to be upfront, I've got a lot of suggestions here. Um, and uh, the creation of the, the committee, this really follows what we did in 2009. And 2009 was a very different process. That's where we were writing recommendations and doing some of the research that has already been done by the treasurer's office and the general assembly. Now we need to do more. There's no ifs and buts about it. I think that uh, the employee groups are gonna have some ideas that we need to research. I think we should research the revenue issues. I think that's important to do. Um, but I think that, um, uh, that we should take a look at this as how do we get to over the finish line? And rather than you know create a report uh, that uh, may or may not have a lot of dust on it, or may or not may or may not end up at the end of that process, we're you know um, helpful to the um, to the legislative session as we move forward. I would think that um, um, the the focus should be on creating legislation uh, for the uh, for the the upcoming session. We've done some studies. We do need to do more um, and um, be informed. But I think that getting over the line is extraordinarily important. You know, in 19, 2019, we did convene a, um, a committee. Uh, Tom mentioned that. And there were a couple of problems with it. One, uh, that uh, uh, it was in the fall of 19 and uh, that it was too big. And I'll get to that point as well when I talk about uh, 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 recommendations here. And the other is that it was interrupted by COVID, but we were late too. We were very late in getting information uh, over to the uh, General Assembly, working primarily with the speaker. And we just ran out of time. And uh, I think that um, uh, we need to give this one the appropriate, appropriate amount of time. But getting back to creation, I think that it's extraordinarily important to have in that creation a recognition uh, that ultimately we can produce recommendations. We did, we can produce options. Joint Fiscal gave you some options to take a look at, but ultimately the decisions that are going to be made are by the General Assembly. When you look at the statute, you make the decisions about benefits. Uh, the, the, the treasurer's office, the retirement boards can give you recommendations. They're not always followed. Um, uh, Senator White, you remember in your committee, we've made different comments over the years that have or have not been accepted. I know the treasurer Spalding had some specific ones when we were creating um, um, Group C, for instance, and we've now done a study of Group C that you were participating in. Um, so I think that um, uh, ultimately you folks are the creator and the owner of the solution. And that that should be very clear in the uh, in the creation of this um, this committee. Um, otherwise, we're not going to get there. Uh, to be very frank, um, I will um, sort of disagree with uh, with Jeff on the issue of um, the the goals. You know, we set a goal to um, to get to those um, uh, to those numbers, and frankly, um, that was a bit of a 
of a, um, a reduction in our original goals because in 19, we were trying to get to reducing the, uh, the prior year valuation results. And that kind of went by the wayside and we said, we'll take those and start with um, uh, you know, the impact on the 2021 um, budget as opposed to the, uh, excuse me, the 2022, as opposed to the 200 and uh, 2021. Uh, now, we did not get there. Uh, we did roughly 78% of, um, of, um, of the target uh, that the Board of Trustees gave us. The Board of Trustees said, go out and try to find a way to get to lowering it to the previous year's level. Uh, ours was roughly $474 million of the total, about 78% of the goal. And on the ADEC, the actual actuarially determined employer contribution, which the uh, legislature needs to appropriate. There is some that comes from, uh, from uh, the locals uh, in that process, uh, some federal grant dollars and some other dollars in there. Um, uh, but uh, we got to about 88% of, uh, of the total. And that's where we, we, we were very clear uh, that that's where we, uh, we, we ended. Uh, you know, you have other options. Uh, you know, Senator Rahm in my first uh, conversation uh, with you folks talked about revenue and that may or may not be part of it. Although I do think, and I think it should be explored, um, but I do think that, that, that some structural changes are, and contribution changes are gonna be necessary. Uh, I think having the goal in there is important um, because it gives you a target. And whether or not you meet that target, it gives you something to work toward. Um, so I would recommend keeping that in, recognizing that uh, there may be some shifts as, and when you get to the actual work, but uh, um, I think that's very important. And again, making sure that the, 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 um, the charge is very clear that you folks are the lead in this. Um, I believe that, uh, again, there will be more options. Uh, I would point out also that the 2009 committee, even though I think that it had a slight, uh, a very different focus, had two legislators on it. Uh, Senator White, uh, you were a member of that um, and uh, appreciate the work that you, you did there. Um, we, um, we, when I'm looking at this, I have similar concerns that uh, the general, uh, that the, uh, the employee groups have mentioned. Uh, one is that uh, the committee is um, too large. And I think that uh, we talked uh, a few days ago about the, and yesterday about the committee on uh, the original proposal from the house uh, that had a 15 board um, uh, uh, for VPIC and uh, it had a commission that had 15 members and then a, a second investment uh, committee and that it was both too unwieldy, which we've seen studies in other states, uh, the BC study, you know, that uh, again, having something in that seven to 10 range makes a lot more sense. And, uh, and having that two tiered structure over there was, uh, was, was cumbersome, although that's not in here. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what uh, a recommendation on how that committee would look. And I, I would, um, I'm going to uh, suggest that it's targeted about eight and that four members of that eight be members of the employee groups. So we have balance. And I've heard that loud and clear from the employee groups over in the house, over here yesterday. And I think that's something that we should, um, we should honor. And it's something that ultimately is very important. When we started our report, um, I worked primarily with the employee groups. And while we did not get to a conclusion and a consensus, it was good work. And uh, I think that um, that was the first and foremost on our, um, on our, um, on our um, agenda. Uh, Madam Chair. I, uh, sure. Yeah. Very echoing. Can, can, Madam Treasurer, can you just say that again? Four of eight. I just, I was trying to yes. make sure I understand exactly yeah. what you're saying. So I would recommend um, um, uh, a board that uh, has the following structure. Um, I think it should have four members of the, um, of the, um, of the employee groups, um, one from the VSEA, one from the VTA, uh, the Troopers Association. So that would mean two out of VSERS. And I think that that, uh, and then two out of the NEA so that you, you, you're representing two from each um, system and you're recognizing in the, uh, in the state system that you have two bodies. Uh, so I think you would have four at that point. I would recommend uh, you know, we had two legislators the last time um, that we um, uh, uh, that we kind of stay in that kind of uh, framework. Uh, there were seven people uh, on that committee, and again, it had a very different focus, but it was manageable. Um, and it did not, by the way, have employee membership. That was a complete mistake, um, and that we don't want to repeat that. 
Um, we had uh, Terry McCaigan, and, and again, your, 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 your chair here, uh, Madam Chair on the uh, committee, and I think that was successful. And again, since I believe that ownership begins with the legislature, I would suggest two co-chairs, which I believe you already have, uh, and the Senate and the House, and that they should be charged with getting to the finish line and that they should be um, appointed by the speaker and the Senate pro tem. And uh, again, that creates a, um, um, a, um, uh, a different level, um, I think, to, uh, to where the, the 15 uh, member committee is. And uh, then I would recommend um, the, um, uh, that uh, the administration be, be represented in this. I think that as we move forward, um, that uh, we're going to need them to be in, in this in terms of buy-in. Um, now, I would also recommend that you talk to Suzanne Young uh, about this, um, as well as others. It could be it could be um, uh, Commissioner Pichek. I think he's great. Um, you know, I I I, I can't tell you um, um, the number of interactions we've had on healthcare, primarily not so much pensions, but healthcare um, have been excellent. And what he's done in terms of COVID, uh, this is a very smart guy. Um, it's possible that the, uh, the secretary would appoint um, him as uh, her designee, but I think it's important to have um, someone at the secretary level um, being recognized as, as, uh, uh, um, as a member of the, uh, of the task force. And it brings in uh, the administration. I would, you know, I did have not had time to vet these ideas with either the employee groups or the, um, uh, or the secretary. I briefly mentioned it to her. I've had conversations about other pieces, but not this, you know, about um, um, with the employee groups. It, um, uh, I, I actually came up with this particular um, uh, structure at two o'clock in the morning last night, and I decided it wasn't a good time to call, um, call Madam Chair or any of um, you members. Um, and um, I don't think uh, Jeff or uh, Mike or, um, or Steve would appreciate that call as well. But uh, I think that, uh, again, having that balance is very important. Uh, you would have the chairs, the co-chairs, recognizing that they are the ultimate owner of the solution, having the administration and the treasurer's office involved, and having an equal number of employee representatives. So you have balance in the process. Now, I will tell you that uh, on the 15th um, um, uh, task force committee uh, process. Um, I, I said that if that was where we were, I don't think I would like to be excused from that uh, because I did not think it was a productive way to go uh, forward. It did have our um, uh, director of, um, of retirement on it um, from, from a practical purpose. Um, uh, that's July is when we um, essentially process 500 retirees with four counselors. Um, and, uh, and, um, and, and two folks that are doing the administration and folks that are answering questions at the front desk. I believe we have 14 people in the retirement office and they're dealing with multiple people, not just the 500, but the others that are asking for information. Practically speaking, uh, she would not be available. She could certainly testify on benefits because I, when we talk, you, you folks are uh, frequently asking about that. She'd be happy to testify. She's very, very smart, but I think that, uh, um, that having a designee from the treasurer um, would be a better approach. And I would probably pick, um, I don't know if he's listening, um, uh, Michael Clausen, our deputy treasurer uh, for two reasons. One, he's familiar with the issues on, on um, that, um, that I've um, advocated as is Erica, but he's also uh, was previously the deputy retirement, I mean, excuse me, the uh, director of retirement. So he has a, a good feel for the benefit structure as well. So I would, that's the structure that I would recommend. Uh, it's lean, uh, but certainly not mean. It's balanced. And I believe that it, um, it, it, it brings in the, the expertise and you will have witnesses. I mean, I think that that's extraordinarily important um, uh, as we move forward. The time frame um, is, is something I'm very concerned about. Um, it, I don't believe it's workable. Um, it's, um, uh, you, especially with a 15 member committee, but, even with the eight person committee that, that I would recommend, um, it does not uh, get you to, to a um, point where you have that decision making. And as I, as I did, meet with a thousand teachers, meet with 350 employees, meet with a uh, hundred people on their council. I think it's extraordinarily important that you give time to do that. I haven't thought about the interim report. That was a great idea. 
Um, maybe there's some interim preliminary, maybe not a whole report, but some interim preliminary discussions about ideas uh, with those groups. I think that it's important to have that, uh, that discussion. As much as I appreciate the, um, uh, the public hearings that uh, the House uh, did convene, I don't think they gave a full um, opportunity for, uh, for employees to uh, participate in the process. And uh, um, I would advocate that, that we do that. And there was one employee that did some investment numbers. Uh, Tom and I talked about that. And Tom, Tom kind of verified his numbers. Um, and uh, I hope he's a math teacher uh, because he did an extraordinarily good job um, in, uh, in, in looking at the, those numbers and the opportunity costs that we lost um, back in the, um, in the 90s when investment rates with uh, inflation rates were uh, really high. And when you look at investments, it's a combination of, of your real rate of return and inflation. And uh, we lost a lot of uh, opportunity there, uh, getting to, um, to Jeff's point about coming into the recession at a lower level. It did not impact the 604 million, um, that uh, um, total increase. That was a, um, um, a separate I issue. Uh, that said, uh, coming in at a lower level, um, you know, into the Great Recession and coming out uh, at the other end uh, from a funding perspective put, does put more pressure on the teacher's system. Um, so again, I, I, I would recommend a, uh, a different time frame. We talked about November, December. I would recommend that it be someplace in late, late November, early December. And the reason for that is timing with the actuarial data. So um, the actuaries will produce a report in October based on the current um, uh, act, uh, actuarial assumptions that uh, we have prior to any changes. Uh, and that'll give you a good measure of where we are. And that will be on November 1st or October 31st. We generally have the meetings in that uh, third or fourth week of um, October. And by statute, um, we're required um, to submit the resulting ADAC rep, uh, recommendation of the boards of trustees and uh, submit those to the governor and the general assembly. So that would give us an opportunity to do that. It doesn't preclude you from having that impact on the 2020 um, 23 budget. Um, as Senator White pointed out that um, uh, you, you've got a very long time frame. well, not a long time frame. hopefully you're not here to June, July, September, um, but uh, in your legislative session, uh, Senator, but uh, uh, that gives you some time um, to, um, um, to, to make some decisions. What the actuaries would do then is go back with any of the benefit changes that you might make, the structural changes, and kind of do a mini, um, they wouldn't do a full experience study, but they would calculate the, um, the changes there. The boards would then have to adopt those um, uh, changes and assumptions that, that are a uh, consequence of the benefit uh, changes you would make. Then recalculate an ADEC, approve it, and um, and then put that into the, um, into the mix for appropriation purposes for, uh, um, for 23, and I'll get to the benefits issue, uh, Jeff, in just a minute. But um, that's the process we used in 2009. Um, uh, essentially, the boards went back to the drawing board, took a look at the changes that were made. Um, the Buck consultants at the time uh, made those changes, and, and, it, and it worked from a time frame. That does not preclude delaying um, uh, some of the implementation. Uh, and I agree wholeheartedly with, um, with folks that uh, people need time to make their decisions. Uh, you can't put something in place on April um, uh, 30th or May 5th or May 12th or whatever it might be and say, by the way, it's effective on July 1st. Uh, that does not give employees a time to, to look to assess what it means to them, what their options are, to perhaps talk to our retirement staff about that. Um, so we people need time to work that out. And uh, the uh, our director of retirement uh, would say that from a, our software going through and making the changes there, verifying that. Um, that would be a practical problem. Um, so that's a practical problem. The, uh, the uh, principal one is people need time. Uh, this is a decision that's very, it's life-changing when you make a decision to retire. And we see that already and when people come in, as much as they're looking forward to retirement, they're, all, they're anxious too. You know, am I gonna have enough money in retirement? Am I going to uh, uh, make the mistake in terms of a survivorship benefit or something and walking through those decisions? And uh, uh, we, we need to give people the time to do that. And they need to hear the message now 
that they will have time from the legislature as well as the treasurer's office. We've been very clear about that. We've said that on our website, um, you know, trying to get that message out. I think it would be very helpful if the General Assembly got that message out as well, that we will give people time. Uh, and uh, I know that the employee groups will help us with that as well. Um, so again, I think that um, uh, the composition is an issue, the time frame is an issue. Um, I think that the, the scope uh, or, or the charge needs to be adjusted um, to, um, to include that uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the charge that the legislature has, again, uh, I'll repeat it, as the creator and the owner of the solution, uh, ultimately. But I do think that um, skin in the game should be there uh, from the treasurer's office and the administration. And I get it. I would invite you to talk to Suzanne about that. I, I, I don't want to um, throw something out and not give people an opportunity to uh, to testify to that. Um, I also would um, I like to comment on one of the some of the scope pieces and some of the things that were raised today. As I said, I took a lot of notes on this. Um, the question of DC uh, defined contribution plans. We have debated that at length. Um, over the years. Uh, I did a session in House Appropriations with, um, I won't say the gentleman's name, uh, all you folks do know him, but uh, that uh, um, is um, uh, a big spokesperson on the issues of defined contributions. He's, think, he's, agree he's um, agreed to debate with me any day I want to. There you go. Um, and we actually did a full, um, full, um, um, uh, six or eight hour um, uh, piece on uh, retirement. So 101 uh, on pensions and, and included another debate between this gentleman and myself. Um, I d many legislators, uh, the, uh, uh, I remember um, Donna Sweeney, the previous House GovOps was there, uh, Mitzi um, uh, Johnson, the, the speaker. Um, I, I'm not the best person at scheduling. I, I scheduled it the Friday before Labor Day. Um, so I really know how to um, um, impact people's uh, schedules. Jeff is saying, you're crazy. Uh, and I was, but we still nonetheless had great attendance. And uh, we had the same question on, um, at, a, at a business roundtable meeting. Um, and I've done this on NPR with them. And I've done this in, in multiple, multiple um, presentations to the GovOps, Senate, House, appropriations, the money committees across the board. Uh, uh, you know, uh, over the years, I've got uh, more PowerPoints on this issue. Beth, um, I, I'm not going <laughs> to, I don't mean to interrupt you here, but I think you're going into a little too much detail about, sure. about things. I think, I think that what we mm -hmm. need to hear is on these points, cross off number F, because we don't need to look at defined contributions again. Sure. Okay. Sure. That's, the, we don't, we, we, we have heard the presentation. So yeah, I would yeah. just ask you to, to kind All of right. focus on your suggestions for the charges with, um, because, because we have right, some right, limited right. time and we really need to get to committee discussion. Sure. Okay. So, so number one, change the charge. Number two, um, I think there's a need to make that committee smaller and still have representation, yep. a balanced reputation, uh, 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 representation. Um, number three, change the time frame. Yep. Um, um, and I think that those are very important. Uh, I, I'll leave the rest of the scope alone, but I think you have some issues there. I would leave the goal there, you know, in terms of fiscal year 22. The last piece that I would talk about is administrative support. Uh, right now, it says that the uh, the, uh, the treasurer's office would uh, provide the technical administra administrative and legal support. Legal, we can't do um, directly. Uh, uh, we have one staff person that's um, the attorney uh, that's actually an employee of the attorney general. The attorney general may be in a position where he has to opine on, on what you folks do, um, and uh, hopefully not, but possibly litigation. Uh, we did do a contract an RFP process, a procurement process, we'd be happy to do that. We can provide some of the technical. Um, I, I would recommend that Joint Fiscal has an individual who has some actuarial experience that, um, that Chris be involved in this as well. So I'd like to share some of that with the, um, uh, with the Joint Fiscal Office. And as far as administration, you know, taking the minutes, warning the meetings, uh, the agenda, I would um, uh, strongly um, uh, ask you uh, to uh, to give that to um, um, to the legislature in one of your bodies because this is a time period that we just don't have the person power to get that done. So I think I've covered our points. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions. 
I, I do have one comment. Our pro tem doesn't appoint anybody. Mm. It's the committee on committees. Yeah, committees. Thank you very yeah. much. Good technical point. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions for Beth? Um, all right. Yes, Senator Rahm. Well, I mean, I don't know if this is a general question for sort of all who have spoken, but is anybody, does anybody want to speak up for this part of the charge of this committee looking at being to look at defined contribution? I mean, it, it, it said, it, it's going to say including anything else they want to look at. So if the task force decides they want to look at defined contributions, they're willing to do that. I don't know that we need to put it in here. Right. I, I, I hope it doesn't seem like I'm advocating for putting it in there. My understanding is there's language in there. That yeah, there is. Happen. And yep. so I, I'm wondering if anybody today wants to defend the specific inclusion of that before we move on. I thought that's what the chair had said. No, I'm suggest. I suggested that we take it out because yeah. they they will be able to look at it, whether it's in there or not. And right. by putting it in there, it sends them in a very specific direction. Right. right. I agree, and this is my speak now or forever hold your peace. Like, is this yeah. important to somebody? No. Wow. Okay. So what I'd like to do, committee, is look at a couple things here. It seems to me that there are two issues that we can start to look at that are pretty clear, timeline and makeup of the committee. So I'd like to start with timeline because that seems pretty simple to me. Yes, Senator Clarkson. Senator Clarkson? Yes. And you know what I'm gonna ask you before we dive into that? Could okay. We, could we have a moment? I mean, could we take a stretch and go to the loo? We've been sitting for- Let's uh, take a vote on it, committee. <laughs> oh, no, yes, we can. No, I, it just, we don't build in and it would be great if we- I know, we, I, I tend not to, but okay, five minutes? Great. Does that work? Okay, five minutes. Gail, we'll be back in five minutes and-